You're listening to Your Rivers Are Wrong, the podcast. My name is Merle. I'm here with my good friend Dante, and we're here to build worlds and tell their stories. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. Good morning, or evening, or afternoon, whenever you may be. Welcome back to the Your Rivers Are Wrong podcast. I'm one of your hosts. My name is Dante. And I'm the other host, and my name is Merle. And we're here as we are every week to talk about the wonderful whimsies of world building, the arts and aesthetics of setting up a setting and telling stories born from it. That's right. All right. So we are coming back from our, well, actually, you're coming back from your birthday weekend. That's true. That is true indeed. Did you do anything interesting, special, fun? Strangely, not not very much, but I did see a lot of people. So that's good. Honestly, That's it's good. it's been very chaotic, which is completely my fault, but it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean your fault? Oh, I mean that I'm so bad at planning and or understanding how time works. Got it. The past weeks <laughs> that I'm kind of like, wait, what happened? What what did I do yesterday? But it's okay. I forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what matters. Yeah. But also it doesn't help because I was um, on Sundays, I was visiting a, a friend whose parents just bought a sort of small farm that they're going to renovate, I guess is the word, which was very nice. So then I was very close to my hometown. So then I slept from Sunday to Monday at my mom's place, which is weird because that's the start of the week. So it feels like <laughs> it's a Monday now for me, but it's not. So that's confusing. It's, oh, well, <laughs> we're trying here. It's it's okay. It, yeah. So did you have like a formal party or did you like bounce not around? Really, and... Not really. More the latter. Yeah. And sometimes... Mm. Uh, I mean, we we don't always do a formal party or something, but now it was also just a bit chaotic in general in my brain. So then it was also fine to not do that. But I just saw a lot of people and had good nice. contact. So that's okay, too. I'm happy. That's good. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask. Well, actually, I, there was no point. I was thinking of asking and then I decided not to ask. Um, <laughs> and you're doing it now anyway. <laughs> yeah, because yesterday we celebrated July 4th, which is... Independence Day for America. Oh yeah, America Day. Thing. You know, <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm like, well, there's no way. I was your July Fourth, and I was like, it yeah. was July the Fourth. That's correct. <laughs> it was <laughs> it comes yeah. right before July the fifth and right after the third. So what's you know. this? You celebrate Independence? Yeah, basically. Help me out here. Oh, okay. So what do you do? Is it like a big public party? <laughs> parade what's what's the deal so what do you do um, yeah but <laughs> i don't know there are parades yes uh, okay okay you're usually it's mostly local play, parades there's no famous uh. one like thanksgiving day parade which is like a global like event to watch but we do have fireworks in the evening which is always very special that's fun yeah yeah can you participate or do you just watch it well that's the thing because some people do participate in like the comfort of their own front yards mm. um i believe it's illegal but ah, people okay. still do it. But it's still a thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like a real giveaway. So after you do it, you got to kind of hide <laughs> your stuff. But yesterday we were heading home from my cousin's house and there were people who were setting it up right in the middle of the street, like firing it up. We were on the highway and we're like, wow, those fireworks That's kind are of really obvious. close. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Those, those, those fireworks are really big. They must be huge by the beach, right? Yeah. So we get off the exit, we make a left turn and it's like right there on the road. I'm like, oh, that's why it's so close. It's <laughs> only a street away. Right. Uh huh. But yeah, it was a nice day off. We got to have a barbecue, ate a lot of fun. Food. That's good times. Yeah, yeah. At this point, July Fourth is kind of synonymous with that co- with that whole like cookout outdoor activity sort of thing. So I'm like, man, could you imagine if our founding fathers signed the Declaration of Independence in December? <laughs> Or January? Yeah. <laughs> like, what they would better we not do? have. Yeah. Hello. Where's the barbecue in this plan? Yeah. No. There were like, there's clearly a missing holiday between Easter and Halloween. Where mm-hmm. should we need something to do somewhere in the summer months? Exactly. Oh, yeah. Let's get our independence in July. That's mm-hmm. a perfect time. And we'll celebrate it for the next <laughs> 215, 16, I don't know, 40 something years. Something like that. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. I think it was a good plan. I'm thinking, plan. Like, do, do we have a July or August? Well, we recently, that was actually quite interesting. There's a thing called, I honestly didn't know about this because of ignorance, (laughs) (laughs) but my work was sort of um, letting us know about it and it's called Keti Koti and it's a day Mm -hmm. for, I think, celebrating the end of slavery. Oh, wow. It wasn't a sort of celebrated thing here, but I saw it in my Google calendar recently and I saw that a lot of people were sort of as a statement forcing it to make it a free day for themselves if they could. They were like, I'm not going to work on this day because this is a thing. Will you join so that we can make it a thing? And it was pretty cool. So I think it was like last Friday, if I remember correctly. 
So that's pretty oh, okay. nice. I'm curious if that will become a thing because that would be pretty cool. So that's the first of July. And this is specifically in the Netherlands, right? I think so. It's so interesting. Because I haven't heard from it at all, like as a sort of main thing. Oh, okay. I'm looking this up now because I want to say this correct. But we used yeah. to have a colony. I don't even like saying it. I mean, it's not false. So that's what it was. We used to okay. have a colony in what now is the country of Suriname. Suriname? I don't know how the English pronunciation <laughs> works. So at some point they declared their independence because they are their own country, obviously. Of course. <laughs> and I think that's what Ketikoti specifically is about. But Suriname is still in history and stuff very much tied to the Netherlands. So I think that's what it was. Got it. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, I hope that becomes a thing. Yeah, literally just this year in America, Juneteenth became a federal holiday. So Juneteenth is June 19th and it celebrates the or commemorates the emancipation of enslaved African-Americans. Oh, so, awesome. That's cool. Yeah, it's yeah, it's a similar feel, I guess. Yeah, I, I think it happened specifically June 19th uh, in Texas. I'm just re- making sure in the Wikipedia article that, I'm, <laughs> that I have pulled up. Mm. Um, and it's so crazy because it's a new federal holiday. It's it's wild. It oh, hasn't cool. happened in a good long while. Yeah, that's so nice. Yeah. Yeah. So funny that you bring that up. Awesome. Hmm. You know, we we come to this podcast to learn new things every day. Yeah, like holidays. <laughs> yeah, like new holidays. So yeah, uh, great weekend. You had your birthday. We mm-hmm. had, um, I guess, the birthday of America. It's pretty much the same thing. <laughs> <Damn>. uh, <laughs> that was such an American like saying. Like <laughs> the fact that oh, you call it the birthday day? of America. I just think that's funny. Yeah. <laughs> no, we have a, we have a lot of memes of like just like swinging. <laughs> American flags or like having bald eagle. Yeah, like eagles and stuff nearby. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. For convenience. If, it, if there's <laughs> yeah. anything awesome. uh, Americans do right, it's the pride of being American. Obviously, yes. Is, that's very true. <laughs> ostentatious. Yeah. Any- uh huh. <laughs> anyway, bring we're it getting back. into the podcast. Yeah, let's get into the podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every week we each bring a topic to the transatlantic table. Mm-hmm. We don't know what each other's topic <laughs> is going to be uh, until we hear it. So that's kind of the fun of it. I believe true. this week you're starting us off uh i think so too yes awesome i will then (laughs) here i go (laughs) there you go okay dante i want to talk about fairies i don't have a good intro i want to talk about fairies (laughs) this is it love it i was thinking for this week's topic that we never properly discussed it even though i constantly bring it up because i like wings club (laughs) yes yes this has been established yeah uh uh-huh exactly i know and i feel like because it's pretty much a genre of its own like fairies, the whole thing, you know, magical girls, the transformation scenes, all that shebang. Sure, sure. We love it. And we want to talk about it. It is fact. We do love it. We uh-huh. do indeed love it. Right. And I remember that at some point in the D&D like game mechanic stuff, they brought the new race that you could play, which was fairies. And I remember right, that right. you were discussing it on your YouTube channel. And I was like, I'm so mm-hmm. happy this exists now. <laughs> <laughs> and I never forgot about that moment. So we should talk about fairies, Dante. Sure. Yeah. Specifically on that uh, announcement, I'll go into that a little bit in yeah, detail. Sure. The Wizards of the Coast released the book, The Wild Beyond the Witchlight, which involved a adventure into the Feywild. And you got to play as the Herringon, which is their renamed race for the rabbit folk, and the fairy, which is wonderful because it's been a long time since we've had a strictly small race. And a, f- a new flying one in particular, and it's mm. kind of the poster child for the Feywild in general. As I was researching into that topic, a uh, small tangent, I had to go to, I think it was a book in second edition D&D called Wonders of the Fair Folk or something or something like that. But, well, Wilds of the Fair, sure, Fair Folk. Yeah. Wow, I'm totally, I'm butchering this title. Um, <laughs> but basically it listed a whole lot of different like Feywild type creatures, which are satyrs, treants. The Shao, which are like owl folk. They were pixies. Oh, they were... that's cool. So it's been around. It's not super new then, I guess. Or I guess it's been reworked or something. Yeah. So it if the Feywild has been a mainstay in fantasy literature. Let's not even say D&D. It's been something in, in classic medieval fantasy for a good while, representing mm-hmm. the, the wonders and whimsies of a magical world beyond our own. Yeah, for sure. And that's been portrayed in a ton of ways in like recent media. Mm-hmm. And also not just in bad or in good ways solely i guess i was looking this up a little bit and i feel fairies almost as the word or as the definition has changed so much throughout cultures but also throughout media and throughout genres i feel i think it has not just one origin which is already Mm. interesting you know because in some cultures fairies refer to the entire magical race or kinds of people or animals or, or folk i guess 
Yeah. And in others, it's just this very specific thing that we know it as now, I would say, which is tiny uh, female persons with uh, wings that can fly and are pretty cute. That kind of feel. Mm -hmm. But there's also a lot of mention of fairies being haunting creatures or sort of spirits of the dead and stuff. That's also a thing that I honestly didn't know before that it had such a background, I guess. Yeah, I think that's really fascinating. And I think I like that too, because now we only, in pop culture, the, yeah, the thing that I described earlier, the sort of cute feminine fashionista girl with wigs, (laughs) you know, is the main staple and I guess the main definition for at least how I know it and I think how pop culture is referring to fairies mostly. But all this background is very interesting to me and also refers to, I guess, how fairy tales in general have changed because fairy tales, the original fairy tales are often way darker. Mm -hmm. We now know the Disneyfied versions of those, right? Which are always cute and sort of, uh, yeah. I mean, I don't have to explain Disney. (laughs) Yeah, but, but all the original like Brothers Grimm and Hans Christian Andersen and all those stuff have a very dark undertone. And I think it's very interesting that that is left behind now in the current definition. Yeah. So there's a lot to this. And honestly, I think a lot more than I initially realized, (laughs) because in my brain, also fairies are just the cutesy girls with wings. Mm. Yeah. I mean, from my point of reference, like I had to read up a lot on the Feywild in D&D just to understand Mm. what it was. Yeah, of um, course. And it's basically the plane of chaos or, or or the plane of like excessive good or excessive whimsy. Obviously, the pixies or the fairies are the, the poster child for the plane itself. But it, when people talk about the Feywild, it's like you don't know what you're going to run into. It's not necessarily good. It's not necessarily bad. It's just different. Uh, you you have to watch out for speaking your true name or making deals mm. un- unexpected or right like there's there's a whole there's a whole hierarchy of the seely and unseely court which are like the theoretically good and bad sides of like fairydom where there's some people out there who mm. are just hoping to be friends with you for the rest of their lives within an incredibly committal relationship <laughs> or or uh, <laughs> or the other half that like simply hopes to steal something from you like your name or your right. voice or your identity. Yeah. There's constantly the worry of the concerns of like, be careful, right? Yeah. This is this is magic gone, gone errant. This is not <laughs> something you're ready for. Like that whole energy. I really love is that. Just though. chaos. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty awesome. Also, the whole, it almost feels already like a fairy tale in itself. The sort of don't stray off the path or you'll lose mm-hmm. yourself. It's kind of very prevalent there. And the Feywild yeah. Wild as a term, I have no idea, but I'm just curious. Is the Feywild Wild a D&D specific term? Oh. Or that- is it wider? The Fey Wild is this, the name attributed to it in D and D, but equivalence of that realm of that space is inc- yeah. is found in all of medieval fantasy. That's just Fair. the name that D and D uses. Yeah. yeah, I figured. Okay, good to know. Yeah, it's basically just like a sister plane to the material plane, which is the one that we sit on. Mm-hmm. Which is it's the contrast to the Shadowfell. The Fey Wild is the excess of emotion, right? And the Shadowfell is the lack of. Yeah. So interesting. Yeah. Um, but Kat, let's talk about how fairies, I guess, are used in like recent stories or things of pop culture and probably like the best way to incorporate them into like stories that you want to build or worlds that you want to build, things like that. Mm-hmm. I feel like that could be a really interesting discussion. Like, have you found yourself tapping into fake creatures in stories that you've written or campaigns that you've run? Has your party come across them at all? Mm, let me think about that. I have to say... I can't think of a specific example right now, but I do always love this trickery sort of uncertainty aspect of it that you were describing Mm. earlier, the sort of making deals and the very metaphorical magic, if that makes sense. I think we talked about this a little bit in, I forgot what the topic was, but we talked about how a language can be used by witches to make deals in a very sneaky way based on the Dale Kingsmill video that she made about black markets and witches or something, I think. And that is a thing that I really, really love. Also because I just love language, but also because I find it a very interesting version of magic or I guess binding deals and stuff like that. So that very much so. And also the the idea of the classical mermaid is also very interesting to me in a way of that it both possesses the femininity or the standard beauty ideal, I guess, and also the deadly part and the fact that it's sort of combined into one creature. And a lot of those fairies and Feywild kind of aspects or magical beings or magics in general have that duality in them. And that's what Mm. I really like about it. And I think in pop culture, if we look at it a bit more recently, I was thinking back to 
my own fairy related obsessions. <laughs> Let me see. I wrote this down. Of course. Tinkerbell, Winx Club, Sailor Moon, Witch, which is also a thing, like the, the abbreviation mm. W I T C H. Right. Yes. That's a thing. That was a whole season. Yeah. That's theories. like a sort of underdog, but it, that's actually very good. She Ra is also there. There's a more recent Nickelodeon series that's called Mia and Me, which is a sort of CGI thing. And it was in visuals very much based on Gustav Klimt's paintings, which is very interesting. I'll, I'll send it to you. Sure. Not the best plot ever, but still very much satisfying the fairy cravings in me. <laughs> so, you know, there's a theme here. And I was like, why is this an interesting thing to me? Or why does this appeal to me so much? The standard answer is, oh, yeah, I'm a girl and I love pop culture, I guess. That's the easy version. And then I was sure, looking, sure. looking a bit into it and also into the genre of magical girls, I guess, because that's uh, a bit more defined than the Western version, I guess, of it. Sure. And it really talked a lot about how the magical girl scene, by which I then also mean the Western versions, is kind of very relevant for making femininity powerful. Mm, Before that, you have fair. superheroes and you have damsels in distress and you have romanceable female characters, right? There's interesting female characters before the magical girl genre, obviously, <laughs> but course, the whole point of, of this genre or the sort of main tropes that come with it is, for instance, transforming into a more beautiful, more mature, more powerful version of yourself. It's sort of a coming right. of age. And then in the process of that, not losing the beauty or something of that. Like you don't have to not be beautiful or there's a sort of thing there, like throughout that entire thing, it's still through and through a feminine thing. Yeah. Maybe for the uninitiated. If you have a magical girl episode or something, there's often, you know, you have your main girl, your main character, maybe two of her friends. Mm -hmm. And for some reason that they probably explained <laughs> or not, <laughs> they are able to transform into a magical girl with beautiful dress and cute accessories and maybe powers of flight or powers of, I don't know, transformation or powers of, you know, cool superpowers, basically. Every time this happens, the transformation sequence takes a while. You want to see the transformation <laughs> every episode. It's kind of the thing. And That's at fair, some point, yeah. you know, you know this by heart. It's not the point that it's new. It's just you want it to be there. That's kind of the part of the genre. And at some point I was thinking like this transformation sequence is, is such a staple, but why does it need to be in there all the time? And I feel like it's a sort of metaphor maybe for, I don't know, womanhood or something to put it like very, <laughs> very broad. It's a very important thing for, I guess, female powerful characters. And I think that's very cool. Yeah, I think that's so interesting. I've never really looked at it in that direction as in like magical girls are an, are an option to display female empowerment within like a media structure uh, in a way that's just really appealing to a lot of people, hmm. like to just kind of transform into a male, more confident, more capable, more brave and adventurous sort of form is always such a cool trope. Um, and just being magical, just in general, like the the idea that you as a normal person can suddenly become a hero is a wonderful yeah. trope in itself, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's not very far from superheroes, I think, in general. Yeah. I feel maybe superheroes didn't necessarily represent femininity in that way or something. So I feel like it's quite logical that it became its own genre, but it's mm -hmm. not so far off. And I feel like that, I don't know, the fact that I don't call them superheroes also says something about how it's presented or something. Right. There's kind of a style or a like a stylistic choice when that happens. Specifically I guess so. those transformations, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm only I'm only realizing now because you've listed it that there were a lot of fairy TV shows. <laughs> <laughs> this is the thing, up. Dante. Yeah. If you know where to look, <laughs> people will watch this, including me. I'm the people. <laughs> I'm people. It's I'm me. People, I'm people, yeah. People. I'm part of the people. <laughs> Another thing that yeah. we maybe is interesting to discuss to maybe round this off a little bit is that it's very often friendship based. There's a very important friendship element to this. I think maybe even all of the shows that I listed, friendship is sort of the main right. deal. And in a lot of other shows, for example, romance is often more interesting than friendship or it's more individualistic. Like the main character has friends and they are their friends and that's an honest friendship, but it's not the main relationship or the most important relationship in the show, right? That can that's valid, yeah. be there as a second thing. But in a lot of these shows, friendship is kind of the, yeah, I guess a sort of basis also for these characters to develop and, you know, go on adventures and stuff like that. Kind of similar to D&D, actually, now that I think about it. It's very much a clique, a group of people developing parallel to each other. Right. And I think it's very interesting that specifically in like magical transformation sort of series, 
they often try to really belabor either the dichotomy or the amplification of the original person's personality, right? Mm. So like someone who's really, really shy in real life, like Clark Kent style, when they transform, they become really confident or really like they kind right. of change themselves to match a hero persona. But there are also other people who are just very loud and energetic and vibrant. And when they transform, that is only like amplified. That's only improved on. And then what kind of as the series goes on and you meet this this cast of of t- transforming magical girls, I suppose, um, you get to see a little bit into their personal life, like what led them to those powers, what kind of formed them into the hero that they're trying to be. Mm-hmm. And you see like their little struggles and you see like all of the little intricacies of their personality uh, that really shines the brightest when they're fighting bad guys or, w- or what's challenged the most when they're fighting bad guys. Yeah, um, for sure. Yeah. Just reacting to a thing that you said a bit earlier, this is an interesting point because you were mentioning the transformed version of yourself or of the character can often be very different or can be opposite of yourself or everything that you're not, your transformed version is. Like Mm -hmm. if you're very shy, your transformed version has a lot of confidence. And I feel like that's maybe more often not the case than it is the case. I was thinking on Wings Club, for instance, and I feel like all those girls have a specific personality, like all the main characters of the group, I guess. But they're also the transformed version of themselves or the source of their power, I guess, also feels very much present in their personality. Like there's one fairy in Wings Club that's called Flora, which is kind of obvious (laughs) at this point, but she is the flower girl. She loves nature. She loves biology. She's like researching things. She has a garden. She loves flowers. Mm. And her powers are nature based and her transformed version of herself is very pastel pinks and greens. So it's it's more of an extension. In superhero movies, more often than not, the superheroes are unrecognizable from their own selves. And very often mm. it's a secret that they are the superhero. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that's, no, that's I feel like yeah. the main thing. And here that's not necessarily the case. Sometimes it is, but I feel more often it's just a sort of a more bigger, important, changed version or a more powerful, but it's more an extension than it is a costume, I guess. Yeah, that's totally valid. Like, I feel like at least in like Western animation, there is, there was at least a heavy focus on concealing identity, making sure that your superhero persona was very different from your mm-hmm. real self so that yeah. um, you wouldn't be recognized. But that is a fantastic, that is a great like observation that uh, like magical girl transformations uh, try to show the strengths of your interests or your passions or, I guess uh, or so. your disposition, yeah. you know? Yeah. I kind so, of like, like everybody that contributes now that different. I think about it. Yeah. yeah. It's not like your own self can't be there. Or is not powerful. It's just the version of yourself that shines brightest, I guess, is the transformed version. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I love it. Cool, cool, cool. Cool. We kind of bounced between a couple topics here, which is... I guess so. <laughs> we started off with fairies started. and then, yeah, superheroes, magical girls. We touched on a lot. <laughs> but that's nice. It's related, you know, so it makes sense. Yeah, I wouldn't mind spending like a full episode breaking down like the tropes of magical girl transformations because it's... Oh, we can do that if you want. Sure. There are distinct differences between that and like the classic superhero. And it's so interesting how popular it is. It's mm-hmm. like a, there's there's an appeal to it that superheroes don't have, which is very, very interesting to dive into. But Do you have a specific thoughts on it already? I think it's... I think the fact that it's it's almost always team-based, I want to say. Like there's very rarely just a single magical yeah. girl. Yeah. You That's know? very true. Yeah. Or not for very long. They'll meet like a rival or an antagonist. Mm-hmm. And it's very much highlighting. I, I, I keep thinking of like Card Captor Sakura as like the original. Oh, one right. of the original ones that I grew up with. Uh, and there's like a gentleness that comes with it, like, at least with that series, that it's like you're trying to capture these these beasts, these monsters out there, but in in a way that's not punch them and kick them and <laughs> bring them down mm. with your weapons, you know? <laughs> Yeah. Um, there's always there's like a there's like a nuance in how you have to confront them. Uh, but that's not in every series. Obviously, I can't generalize all of the Mahashodra genre. That's mm-hmm. wild. And there's so many now. There's too <laughs> so. much. Yeah, that's a like, yeah, don't start that. <laughs> but yes, I think that's very true. I was thinking back on how in Wings Club you have a thing called convergence spells, which is basically friendship spells. Like you have to use multiple people to do one spell and oh, then it awesome. becomes like thrice as powerful or something. It's kind of a thing, yeah. Honestly, I didn't realize this until we started talking, but it's so friendship-based. That's kind of awesome. Because <laughs> superheroes are, again, also very individual. I mean, you have the Avengers and stuff. I mean, you know more about this. The but team-ups. Yeah, right. but it's not necessarily... Like, they all have their own comic. 
<laughs> and it wakes that's up. Fair, that's fair. That defeats kind of the point. Right. That's interesting. They can be in the spotlight, right? But then it's always as a, you know, the others are supporting or they find out something about and then they always end up in the, you know, friendship will overcome whatever we face or something. Yeah, there's there's much less one magical girl gets a spin-off series, you know? I guess that, so, that yeah. all the time in superhero franchises, but not necessarily in like magical girl stuff. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, plenty to talk about, I'm sure, mm-hmm, in the mm-hmm. future. That's awesome. Is it all right if I bump to my topic then? Yes, go for it. Cool. This is also a little bit of a wild card. I can tie this okay, in we just like a little it. bit. Uh, one of the first magical girls introduced to the Western animation, uh, which introduced to the Western audiences from Japanese anime, is indeed Sailor Moon, uh, mm-hmm. kind of one of the flagship uh, magical girl anime, or just anime in general that's made it to the West. Changed so, the genre, yeah, for sure. So my topic today, uh, very specifically, is the moon. Oh, I want to talk about the moon. Hey, good bridge. I like this. <laughs> awesome. You did so, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Obviously, the closest celestial body to our dear Earth, mm-hmm, the moon, mm-hmm. plays a lot of roles in mythology and storytelling. There's kind of a role it plays. It's always very, very visible, regardless of the story you tell. It's recognizable. Every every world has a moon. <laughs> It's it's one of those it's one of those things that is just so iconic to a setting simply because you can look at it unlike the sun uh, shout outs <laughs> to the sun but moon is way nicer to look at shout um, outs to the sun <laughs> shout outs to the sun but we we like the moon here yeah and I guess I was thinking about it uh, while I was planning this topic uh, through the nighttime the moon <laughs> is kind of a different topic from outer space from stars yeah it touches from, on like, more things yeah yeah and I and I do kind of want to uh, just do a, a quick run through of all the things it could possibly represent and eventually what it could tell what kind of story it could tell or what involvement it can have in this world that we're trying to build. I kind of just want to go through a bunch of them and we'll see what catches our attention. The moon, when I thought about it in particular, often represents some sort of omen. It's like a representation of how the world's doing. Uh, A pure and light Mm -hmm. and clear moon means that the world is doing perfectly fine. But if there's something strange about it, warped, twisted, miscolored, uh, it says in senses that the night is not quite as it usually is. Um, examples of this, of course, for example, is the Blood Moon, which happens in the Reg- uh, Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, where when it turns bright red, it rec- represents the height of Calamity Ganon's power, mm-hmm. and all the enemies get uh, reappear and become kind of enraged. Get buffed, yeah. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Um, in the same line, of course, the, the, the moon in Majora's Mask of Legend of Zelda is the one with the really scary face and sets the world <laughs> on a timed apocalypse as it comes crashing down onto mm-hmm. the planet. Yeah, that's also very scary. Uh, One of my favorite anime is Soul Eater. Soul Eater, basically in Soul Eater, the moon literally has a face that is crazed and deranged. Uh, And (laughs) as the series gets more intense and like things start falling apart, the moon's face becomes more and more deranged uh, to the point that they eventually fight on the moon, which is a whole thing. That's kind of the final arc of the series. Uh, And... A fighting on the moon is its whole is a whole thing too. It's like uh, mm. Super Mario Odyssey. The final planet is literally going to the moon and mm. fighting there. Goran Lagan, one of the uh, one of my favorite uh, series, involves a bunch of robots uh, that you fuse with to become more powerful. Basically, gra- gathering the collective energy of the universe. And one of my <laughs> favorite favorite things is when the main robot fuses with the moon. Literally <laughs> combines with the moon. Turns the moon into a giant robot, and they continue fighting greater and greater things. So, oh my god, that's a lot. <laughs> so, with all that in perspective, what in the world is everybody's fascination with the moon? Why is it so special? Why does it keep getting touched on in these stories? Is there like an innate thing about it that everybody loves? Like, why is it so special? I guess as like storytellers, world builders, yeah. Thing. The important question. I feel this is, that was a perfect description of how the moon is in so much stuff. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And I feel like the way you started this topic is exactly the explanation for it. It's the closest abstract celestial body that we know a lot of, but also not a lot of, but we see it all the time. Right. That's a unique position to be in. There's not a lot, there's literally nothing else that we, I mean, constantly see and know that is close to us as a celestial body. Right. Good question. The moon as a concept is fascinating to us because it presents a sort of concrete, more literal version of space. It's a sort of traversable place to go. 
Not that's, that we can yeah. do that very easily, but you know, we've been there. It's a landscape right. you can be in. And isn't that wild? That's that very wild. Vi- yes. <laughs> the first time we visited the moon was in the last century. Yeah, that's pretty wild. In this in the long history of, of humanity, in the last century, we touched on the moon. That's absolutely wild to me. Sorry, side tangent. Crazy. You're very right. <laughs> and also, I mean, some people still don't believe it. <laughs> but <laughs> No, but that's so true. That's a wild thing. But the fact that we did it makes it instantly an achievable goal, an achievable right. place to go. We have set foot on that place. We know what mm-hmm. it's made of, I guess. <laughs> I don't, but the people know what it's made of. <laughs> you know, we can put a rocket on there it's and it cheese. won't fall. It's made of cheese. We know yeah. how gravity works. Yeah, it's made of cheese. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's a sort of literal version of what we know so little about, which is space in itself, the enormity of space. The fact that space is so big, so enormous that we literally can't perceive it because we have a very small human perspective, right, makes it very hard to grasp. And similar to the underwater world that we know nothing about, or the micro world, which is like the tiniest molecules or atoms and stuff. We know a little, very little about it because it's so hard to grasp Mm -hmm. from our perspective. And I think because the moon turned into a very graspable, I guess, version of that, like we know how big it is. It's smaller than Earth. And we kind of understand how big Earth is, even though we have a human perspective. Earth is already very big for us, right? Like it's hard to understand how big this place is that we live on. And the moon is a literal kind of understandable version of that. So I think that's the very first step to understanding a fascination with space. And that's why I think many people and media and stories can traverse to it easily, I would say. Right. I I imagine, I'm not positive, but I'm sure that the, the literature that is written about the moon drastically changed when NASA got to it, you know? Like I be- like probably before that must we be were right. able to yeah. traverse it, like it was treated as sort of almost a deitic, like divine thing in the sky that is, you know, always tied to some sort of God. To Holiness over or, us. yeah, exactly. Yeah. But once we were able to like traverse it, so I'm, I'm, I imagine that, but I mean, that's exactly when like spacefaring literature just got literally went to the moon. <laughs> if we really <laughs> yep, went to the moon, that's like, right. Uh, people just started writing about spaceships and travel and like journeying. I th- I think about the phenomena of like low gravity in space. Probably that wasn't very much talked about before like Buzz Aldrin started bouncing around there. You're absolutely right in the fact that everything about moon or space related stuff was like a booming thing in, I think, yeah, 60s, right? Yeah. I remember in um, art history class, we learned how how suddenly plastic became a sort of staple in fashion because it looked very scientific. And we suddenly Mm. had these furnitures that were, I think we now call it mid-century modern, but that looked very much like like space shuttles and like very cool sciencey sci-fi things that were often plastic or had like rounded corners or looked super shiny or stuff like that. This whole thing of, oh, this is doable or this is a thing that we want to achieve now. Also again the sort of patriotism, I guess, involved in that. Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah can shape the world. And I think it really did. And that's, yeah, that's a very logical, I guess, transformation from not knowing a lot about it, therefore not having it in stories as a concrete thing versus to what it is now. Yeah, I think obviously there's a very scientific uh, angle you could look at the moon. You could look towards the moon for, which is like space travel, exploration, the advancement of technology, like the calculations that it took to get to the moon, as I understand it. Uh, the, the, The Computing hardware that was used at that time is about equivalent to like a dozen Nintendos. Like <laughs> the techno- technological Wild. advancement has wildly advanced in the last 50 years to the point that reaching the moon is not nearly as difficult as it was, as, as, as it was at least to compute currently. Sure, um, yeah. The, the, the rapid advancement of technology, sci-fi in general, was wholly changed once space travel became a thing mm-hmm. or, sp- or the concept of space travel even being a thing isn't that, that's that's wild in itself and but in like fantasy the moon still holds this divine aspect this thing that again represents transformation like the phases of the moon i gotta bounce mm-hmm. towards transformations that happen at night like lycanthropy like it's it's this representation of yeah. 
uh, a, a, a watchful power in the darkness, this glowing aspect always surveying the things below. Such a strange and I don't know, I don't want to use fancy words here, but like a phenomenal <laughs> co- combination of what is achievable by man and what is perceived as divine and the bridge yeah. between the two happening in our life, not in our lifetimes personally, but in the lifetimes of our parents and grandparents. Absolutely wild. Yeah. Like, blows my mind. Super wild. Completely agree. Like yeah. I was wondering oh, or thinking on the fact that the moon also isn't completely detached from us in a way. Like we know it has influence on certain things. For yeah. instance, the tides, right? That's a thing exactly. that's been right. caused partially by the gravitational force, I guess, that the moon has on us, depending on where it stands in the sky or something. I mean, mm-hmm. I'm not a scientist, so this is all I know about it, but <laughs> no, and maybe in a more like old wives tale kind of version there's at least in my surroundings a lot of talk that women have a different sort of monthly cycle based on whether it's a full moon or not which is also Mm. weird to me i don't know if that's an official thing because that's hard to grasp but couldn't tell you you know like it has (laughs) either literal impact on us or i guess folktale impact on us we want this influence to be there or something i mean like Truth is stranger than fiction. We live on a giant floating <laughs> rock in the middle of outer space with another floating rock just floating around us. Yeah. Could I have explained that? If, if we no. didn't have a moon, if we didn't have a moon, putting that into a fictional novel would be like mind bending. Yeah. Right. That's true. It would be fantastical. <laughs> to just have another tiny planet rotating <laughs> around your planet. Crazy. What do you mean? Wild. Yeah. It's impossible. That's Which is that also often in fantasy. I don't know if you had this phase, but I had a phase where I looked up a lot of wallpapers with like secondary planets just hanging out in the sky with like pink skies and stuff. And I didn't know anything about the world, but it was like <laughs> fantasy wallpaper. And then you always had like three moons because it just looked cool. That's also kind of the vibe I'm getting here. Like it's yeah. very cool if you if you can look at to other planets or something or see space happening live in the sky, I guess. Yeah, just just the idea that there is another world. Yeah, yeah, yeah you know, crazy. So close to so close to our world that is just right there, mm-hmm. floating around, and mm-hmm. we see it every day. Mind blowing, crazy, yeah, for sure. Creative, truly really, um, <laughs> inspirational. Inspirational <laughs> feat, yeah. Uh, but yeah, the moon. It's sick. It's so cool. <laughs> uh, maybe I maybe I just made this to gush about the moon. I love I love talking about the moon. I think I think that thing is wild, crazy. Do you feel like maybe in general? Did you ever make or run or play in a specifically like planet based world? I don't have the storytelling chops to do that. That <laughs> like there could casually be right. another whole planet that I have to flesh out and detail and describe. Mm. I don't get the chops for that. I'm sure people are really good at that. If you're looking for a series that does it well, Star Trek Odyssey, Dimension 20, advertise it like every five episodes. Uh huh. Of yeah, course, of just, course. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the ability to create a new world with a new social structure and, and a, cult, a civilization beyond my scope. Like, give, <laughs> give me a little town, maybe a little, maybe a continent. I could do a continent. But, but I mean, world, I feel like the planes in D&D, like the sort of yeah. overlaying worlds are also pretty close to like a new planet or a new social structure. That's not too That's far off the idea of a planet. That's fair. But I didn't write those. I just read it. And I pick up on okay, it. Okay, okay. Fair, <laughs> fair. But that, I mean, that feels already more doable, though, if it's more like an overlay of our world. Maybe because you true? have more, like, literal, like, focal points that you can lay over each other or something. I don't know. I mean, but if I ever had to take, like, a D&D campaign to the moon, uh huh. I think I, I think I could do it. I could figure something out. Yeah. The, 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 moon, the moon is straightforward enough that I could probably... The moon is straightforward enough. I feel like yeah. that's constantly our point here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because the moon, in the general scope of things, like the moon is a, one of the least interesting ones in the whole space <laughs> thing, right? Like you have Mars, which has like <laughs> copper and water and all this weird stuff. Mm. And then you have just the moon that doesn't really like it's part of it's, just it's not even a planet. Yeah. It's not like in a different it's a nice universe. Rock. It's a nice yeah. looking rock. Yeah. <laughs> probably, probably the nicest looking rock we got, got to say. I mean, besides Earth. yeah, besides Earth. That's true. And we'll there we talk about Earth. <laughs> Next episode. Next episode. Tune in. Yeah. Next episode. Cool. I think that's all I had to say about it. Nice. I'm sure I could talk about more things, but that's that's good for today. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Let's wrap this up. Let's <laughs> bounce over to our prompt for the day. We always end every podcast with a storytelling or world building prompt. Mm-hmm, uh, one mm-hmm. person plans it, the other person improvs it. And today, I believe you have the topic. Yes. 
That's true. Very much based on what we talked about or discussed, I guess, with the fairy topic. Awesome. I want to tap into a little bit of this friendship magic that we talked about. The way that spells or magic or, I guess, magical abilities can come from multiple people at the same time and how that changes it. So I want to have a back and forth chat, very small, what friendship magic could look like as a concept. Okay, so I'm a little, I'm going to be a or little Or maybe more here. concrete if you want to, like, give me one friendship spell. Got it. Now, Either way. Oh, gosh. I, I, I'm supposed to improv this topic, but I already have a perfect example from one of my favorites. Also manga. fine. Um, if you didn't say it, I don't know it. <laughs> uh, I, I could spin something at the end, but this is this is my favorite. No, go for it. I like it. One of my favorite manga that never took off because it got canceled, which was devastating to me. I was Aww. actually devastated. Um, there was a series called Double Arts. Double Arts was about a, re- a really adorable pair of a guy and a girl who have this they have this whole plot line that's not very detailed but the catch of their magic which they realized was that when they are or or they, I think the boy's magic was what it was the boy's magic was that when he is holding somebody's hand his strength is doubled oh. and when he is holding when multiple people are chained are holding hands in chain they can like the power is multiplied by the number of people holding hands so Wild. there was a scene okay. where basically there was like 50 people all holding hands with him and they were able to like lift a house and move it somewhere else, Oh, which was crazy. crazy. So the girl, her, her catch was that she was very sick or very ill. And the only way she could survive was to, um, to hold his hand and latch onto Aww. his vitality because he, he was like an ever flowing fount of life and vibrance. So he was the source of that then, right? So if yeah, two random people would hold that. hand, it wouldn't do anything. It wouldn't work. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it was very it. specifically that pair. The whole concept of it was like, if she ever lets go of him, she might die. Like, it was very. That's very nice. Like, I mean, sad, but good, good storytelling. <laughs> the series was like 20 something chapters. And oh. it was my fa- When it came out, it was my favorite, favorite thing because the pair, <laughs> the author is so good at writing cheesy fluff rom-com stuff. And like the dynamic between them was adorable and they were invent they were on the process of inventing a martial arts style that involved both of them that kind of looked like a dance. Oh, awesome. Okay. Because people were trying to steal his power, you know, power sure, that amplifies, yeah. power that multiplies, incredible power to grab. Mm. So they had to stay together and protect each other. And that involved enveloping this dance like fighting style. And it was going to be so good and so wonderful. And then it got canceled Aww, and, I got, and I got hurt. Poor you. <laughs> it was a dark time in Stab my life. In the heart, Don't like y'all. to talk about it. But yeah, friendship <laughs> magic. Um, Funny. To, le- to lean into this prompt and try, try to improv it a bit. Um, we could talk about... About um, power by proximity, like the closer yeah, you are to sure. somebody, the stronger you get, which incentivizes these, I guess, pair or trio of heroes, whatever mm-hmm. this might be, to stay close to each other, to be close. And when they're pulled apart in separate directions, they are at their weakest. It is when they are fully as a as a whole unit that they can show all of their uh, most powerful abilities. Can this be there or work between? Any two or three or four people, or does it have to be someone that you can make that connection with? Well, it, would you want this to be a universal force? I suppose there would have to be some caveats if you want to attribute it to like the entire world, right? I guess I'm thinking like, uh, is there a sort of concept here present that is about finding the right people? Oh, I'm sure there's got to be. It can't just be any old people, right? Yeah. There's got to it's got to be some sort of unspoken contract or some weird, some specific. Yeah, it's got to kind of work. Yeah, click together. I guess. Yeah, yeah. like friendship. <laughs> it's already <laughs> like, a metaphor. Ah! Like friendship. Yeah, it already exactly. exists. Okay. Okay. No, here. but got it. Yeah, that's interesting because then we can talk about dynamics between people, right? Like, what if right. one connection between two people or three people was so strong that it would be stronger than your usual connection between more people? You would imagine there'd be like a system of resonance, right? Where people, uh, more very specific people with specific, uh, I don't know, either, either dispositions or blood types, if you want to make this either physical or emotional, sure, yeah. that work best together. And mm. if you want to make this into a compelling story, the strongest groups would be people who are collectively dissonant. People who don't agree with each other, who have differing views or different personalities. Right. It, you, you could play with the idea that like-minded people are strongest together 
But you could also play the trope of like, but if everybody has a different perspective and offers a wide Opposite range track, of ideas, kind of, yeah. then they are most powerful. You know, mm. it's 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 like similar resonance versus different resonance. Which of those combinations works the best together? An uh, obvious metaphor towards real life, where <laughs> uh, <laughs> a, a varied friend group or a, or a very similar friend group has different dynamics, but can both be very strong. You know? Yes, very true. Very true. Of that. Uh, and I guess if we want to make this a fantastical concept, how does that manifest? What does that look yeah, like? Yeah, what's, what's the literal version of this? How do we practice this magic? Well, if this was a shonen leaning anime, it would be strength. It would just be straight up <laughs> like fighting power. Breaking you know? things, yeah. <laughs> like people glow when they're close to each other. There's like a whoom, sure. whoom, kind of like a humming sound in the yeah. background when they're really close. I feel like I like the idea of kind of channeling it, though. I feel like there needs to be a sort of prep to this. Oh, where like one person can empower another person sort of thing? That too, maybe. But I feel like it can't just be a passive thing that happens because you're close enough to each other. I feel like it's mm. there still needs to be a sort of thing that allows it to blossom or something. I feel like there still needs to be a practical thing. I don't know, you wave a wand or you say a thing or you <laughs> do a little dance and then it sort of channels that proximity that you already have. You know what I mean? You do a little dance. It's like a Power Rangers thing <laughs> where like it's beedy, a beedy, 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 you got go. you got to do the pose. You got to yeah, do the pose. Exactly. Pose, yeah. pose, pose, transform. Yeah, I want a practical thing to this. <laughs> Gosh, I can't get the dance out of my head. I'm trying to think of other things, but I keep thinking of Power Ranger poses. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I was going to say I'm not I'm against it, but I'm kind of against it. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's just like a word. Maybe it's like a maybe a special a phrase word. or yeah, like, a sort of mantra thing. Yeah, like yeah, that. and everybody has their own. Uh, it could be like something that unites the group. See, now this is where it gets interesting again because then you can talk about language too. Like, what do two right. words combined mean or say about the connection? Or what do three words mean? Or what does the order of the words that you say it in mean? Maybe how does that change the way you channel it? Yeah, or the output of it, I guess. Could you imagine if the transformative sequence was based on like what you said or like your uniting <laughs> words? Like there's like a very specific friend group who their like transformative words are Friday night tacos, which is very deep and <laughs> profound to them. Yeah. But, but when they transform, they just become like this God superpower like. fast food group. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I agree. I will watch this probably. There's a lot of directions this can go. <laughs> I was thinking of fight. Do you remember fighting foodons? Was that a thing in the Netherlands? I have no clue what you're saying. Okay. Don't worry about it. It's about <laughs> fighting food. Food that fights. Um, <laughs> Totally I think I know all about this now. Not like even... you don't even need to. That, that's literally what it is. <laughs> that's Wonderful. What it is. Yeah. I feel like on a more serious note, though, if we have like I guess more general words, I was thinking like, what if one person has I don't know, pff, uh, light energy and their word is light, and then another person has uh, nature energy and their word is bloom or I don't know or nature. Then the combination of that can also be a combination of that magic or of that power, I guess. Like, there's a lot of possibilities. Yeah. How interesting would it be if you had a singular power? If you had like a singular power, but it could only manifest in the presence of somebody else. In the else. combination? So, Ooh. So like, you can't That's just have light powers. There's always something that has to be mixed in there for it to manifest. Wild. So yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Like sunlight, moonlight, starlight. Uh, that's the same thing as sunlight. Uh, <laughs> but like, but very specific like themes in one combination. Yeah, like, yeah, oh, yeah. Gosh, it's, it's the, it's like Kirby or Mega Man when they take people's powers and they're, they're, they're your buster combined with like wood Oh, you get the combination Man. versions? Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Cool. Gosh, yeah. I, I love combination magic. That is, that is its own topic in a software. I Big mean, fan you can, things. yeah, this is like tip of the iceberg here. <laughs> tip of the iceberg. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. If anybody, if anybody's out there, you won't be supporting the artist anymore, but if you, because it's canceled, but if you can find double arts out there, uh, worth the, worth the read, if only to be heartbroken at the end when it's canceled. Oh. Yeah. Uh, worth Absolutely the heartbreak. Okay. Yeah. That's a solid recommendation. Yeah. <laughs> they did come out with Nisekoi afterwards, which was my one of my favorite rom-com and Oh, uh, okay, but, okay. It but eased still. the pain. Okay. It eased the pain. Oh, poor double you. Arch was a, double Arch was a heartbreaker. But anyway. Thanks for listening. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm sure <laughs> cool. that if you care about fairies or magical girls or the moon, um, this Which episode you is should. for you. 
Yeah. Which uh-huh. you should. I, all valid topics. Very. If there's anything else that interests you, we do have, we officially have a catalog of 25 other episodes to check hey, out. Hey, that's How wild true. is that? But I hope these episodes uh, encourage you or inspire you to world build or storytell. Look forward to the kind of things you can come up with with your own creativity or things that you're simply inspired by. Um, but as you work on these things, as you do, as you create these wonderful worlds, always, always remember. Yeah, there's that one thing. The one thing. We keep saying it. Your rivers are wrong. Yeah, they're still pretty wrong. <laughs> Listen, that can be fixed eventually with time. With Just practice, keep listening. But, yeah, eventually we'll today. figure this out. <laughs> <laughs> not today. Uh, see you next time. There we go. Have a good one. <laughs> see ya. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Your Rivers Are Wrong. If you have any questions, comments, or ideas for future episodes that you'd like to hear us cover, feel free to contact us at yourriversarewrong at gmail.com. Our intro and outro music is written by Maarten Schellekens. Thanks for that. And again, thank you so much for listening. We hope to see you at the next one.